Hello and welcome to the CAD Dimensions 3D Printing Podcast. This is a little thing that we do every month where we get together to talk about 3D printing. And here at CAD Dimensions, what we want to do is we want to empower engineers everywhere to change the world by giving them the best tools possible and helping to get those out there so that they can, you know, do good things. Um, before we dive into all of the, the 3D printing stuff we have to talk about, we have big companies to talk about, we've got small companies to talk about, we're talking about croissants, we're talking about bioprinting, it's gonna be a lot of fun. If you're using 3D printing today, leave a comment below telling us what you're doing with it because we love to see all different creative uses for technology. Um, anyway, before we start, I think Ben has something that he wanted to show off. Yeah, this is our our desktop metal printed part, huh? Yeah, desktop metal, 3D printed part. Most important use I is love a how, bottle opener. Yeah, that's the first thing that everybody <laughs> came back with. Like we we told everybody in the office, guys, the printer's here, it's working now. Terrific. Can I get a bottle opener? <laughs> like that was the first thing everybody wanted. Anyway, yeah. uh, we don't want to waste a good bottle opener. So what do we have? Uh, what do we have today? Uh, got some ice cold American Pilsners, I think. <laughs> well, it's Let's just see if it works. so we're recording this. It's it's yeah. just a couple of days before the Fourth of July holiday, and uh, does it work? Does it work? Oh, it works. Look at that. Let's, check, let's check the integrity of the bottle opener. <laughs> hey, okay. no I mean, it's wow. metal. It, it's it's metal. Stainless steel survive, survives. There you go. You hey, good? thanks. Thank you. Of course. Two more. Two uh, more. <laughs> I guess I'll wait then. I was about to. You know, I'm just realizing these are twist offs, and this is <laughs> really a kill, really folks. silly use of uh, probably the most expensive bottle opener I will ever hold. Uh, but regardless, uh, actually, do you want to know a fun trick? What's a What's a fun trick? <laughs> if you have a tungsten carbide wedding ring, I do. Um, by far do the you? best I do. I have a tungsten wedding ring. Best way to open a, up a beer bottle. Yeah. Yep. My cousin always, showed it to me. They always warn me that the tungsten is super, super hard. So if you ever break your finger, um, yeah. you're going to be screwed when you go to the hospital because the hospital will have the tools to cut off your finger, but not the tools to cut not off the ring. Wrong. wrong. That's what I was told. That's what I was told. This, I, I've been married 11 years now, so that's what I was told at the time. Cheers, okay. by the way, guys. Cheers. Salute. Cheers. Happy 10th podcast. I, I don't so. know. I have no idea what it is. Uh, I think it might be 10th. We're, we don't need to keep track. Yeah. It's a, ten, it's a good million. podcast, and we're halfway through 2019. And what a year 2019 has been. Anyway, uh, we should probably get to the 3D we have printing to talk stuff. About, yeah. yeah, we have more important things to talk about. Anyway, um, I wasn't quite sure where we wanted to start, so I guess we'll dive in. Uh, a really popular 3D printing company that you might have heard, with, heard about, they became famous with a TED Talk claiming to make 3D printing 100 times faster. Do you know who it is, Kevin? 100 times faster. I'm going to go ahead and say carbon. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good guess. Was it really? <laughs> hey, <laughs> look at that. Uh, so carbon uh, was in the news this past month because they got more money. Why do they need more money? Um, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. Um, well, what are they going to do with their money? I guess it's materials development. Okay. R- R&D. Yeah. Um, is, there, is that really where just the next envelope is going to be for this industry? I mean... Materials development is really important. Only because I feel like we talk about applications and we talk mm-hmm. about 3D printing technology and every so often, but it's always tied to a material. It's right. always tied to an application. Is that really mm-hmm. where the envelope is just going to continue? Because you've got the basic techno- technological tenants down now, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. where the, it's going to get pushed. Yeah. From a, from a process basis, you know, we have UV cured plastics and we have thermoplastics that get melted. Um, so really it comes down to how many different types can we do, how strong can we make them, and all of those things. Um, so how much more money does carbon need? Um, <laughs> they got a few hundred million more. Sure. And their evaluation was at uh, $2.4 billion. See, that's surprising to me that that's like a public valuation because you got to figure. It's not a public valuation. Oh, it's not a public valuation. No. Okay. Carbon, carbon is still private. Okay. And so you can't go buy carbon stock or anything like that. Um, and that's, I think, how they get that super crazy valuation. Because say what that Because is. it's not, because it's based on, like, uh, venture capital evaluations. It's right. not based on, like, revenue, revenue or cash flow or, I mean, I'm sure they take those things into account in some way. But a lot of it's the technology, their IP, all of that. Sure. R&D, your investment in, your valuation ha- also hangs on what you 
promise for the future. Right, yeah, so here's what product we're going to deliver in five years and 10 years and what mm -hmm. that represents, and that makes sense. Yep. Probably the same, relatively the same guidepost that you'd use for a public valuation at, at some degree, right? Yeah, have yeah, you, at some degree. Have you read anything about what they, have they released anything new? I mean, I read very briefly them talking about multiple material. Yeah, from but what from what else. I gathered is this is an investment from one of their current partners. So they've oh. been partnered with Arkema, if I'm saying yeah. that correctly. Ar Arkema. 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 Okay. Ar Arkema. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, those people. It's a French materials company. They've been partnered with them since like the very beginning, and so this is just Arkema giving them more money to develop their materials for carbon's machine oh, carbon's okay. process. Do you think it's going to be for sneakers? Um, yeah, one I do. Them, yeah. I definitely do. Adidas. <laughs> is that one of their big big future use cases they're targeting as well as Rudell? Yeah. So, beyond prototyping, like I'll be able to buy You can right now. Yeah, you can today. Like 3D if printed you, if you Adidas got like, shoes? Yeah. 400 bucks. Yeah, you can get yeah, 3D printed shoes. <laughs> <laughs> they're, uh, they're not cheap. But, Hopefully. Uh, I'm, I almost always run on Adidas ZX shoes. ZX 4000 4D shoes. Wow. 4D yeah. shoes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I believe at uh, at Rapid, their entire team was wearing the shoes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the past. And at AMUG. They were all wearing them, too. Ago, they were all wearing <laughs> okay, them. see, I thought that was it's just like conceptual uniform. stuff. I didn't realize that that was consumer ready. No, That's kind of well, neat. Okay. They want to get it more into mainstream, obviously. $350 is not a, it's not a price point. Long term, for, yeah. long term goal, but right. hopefully they can get it down. That's and cool. hopefully. But, okay, so if I'm going to buy new shoes, I'm an avid runner. If mm -hmm. these. Uh, do they have like a benefit? Is it like the, just because it's made that way doesn't mean like the shoes are going to last that any longer? Better. That it's better? That it's going to be more I think customized orthotics? Or? Right, right. It can be customized for your foot. Yeah. And so you do like be, your Dr. Scholl's readout at the drugstore. Yeah. Bring that, send that to Adidas. And they custom make a shoe for you or something. Right, mm -hmm. and they can base it on like your height and your weight and put more support or less support in different areas. Yep. I think that's the goal, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. weight. I think they're lighter. Yes. Yeah, yeah they're lightweight, lightweight shoes with the same Which is big on running. Springiness. Yeah. Um, athletics, I can see cleats and like things like that. Anywhere mm -hmm. where performance athletes are looking for an edge, those things are important. Yeah. Cool. Um, but Carbon's kind of found a niche in like the foam substitutes, if that makes sense, by doing those yeah. really intricate lattices instead of normal closed cell foam. That's it's almost so like, like high density impact. Yes. Kind of foam, the, like the, the shoe Adidas, and, uh, the Adidas running stuff. sneakers that I had for the past year were cloud foam shoes. Yeah, and that's exactly what it was. But over the over the course of eight, you know, eight ten months running on them, the foam didn't have the same support anymore. Okay. And any, anywhere you have my feet started to hurt, I'm like all right, shoes yeah. are over. So maybe if the lattice is, you know, in place of that, maybe that's a better solution for the technology they have already. Yeah, maybe. As someone who hates running, <laughs> I have no idea what that's like. <laughs> Um, but uh, you don't do 400 miles but, in a month? Uh, absolutely what? not. No, no, thank you. Um, but I'll take your word for it that the shoes wear out over time they do, they do. and the foam wears out. Um, the other big company that we wanted to talk about, um, not private but a public company, is GE. Mm -hmm. And GE uh, has pledged money year over year to give to schools for 3D printing. The idea is that they want to, you know, kind of help pioneer uh, people learning about 3D printing. So it's it's not an investment in STEM. It's specifically yes. an investment in 3D printing, or it's, yes, it's an investment both. in 3D printing, but they're calling it a STEM investment for the sake of right, yeah. right. optics. So yeah, the, the number that they're giving out is they want to provide 3D printing to 10 million children by 2020. One million. That was 10 That's million. That's what I'm looking at. One million kids, ten million dollars. Yeah, oh, over the one, next one million years. students Got is it. what it says. Yeah, <laughs> backwards. Uh, over at over two thousand schools, and uh, that's pretty pretty bold project. But as somebody who has a child age or a kid in school yeah. age, that's yeah. pretty cool that you yeah. know he'd have opportunities like this. You know, as a parent, that's neat. Yeah, I mean, school printers are not horribly expensive, but when you don't have a lot of money to work with in the first place. Obviously, it's harder to, so, harder to keep running. So why do you think GE is making a push for this space now? I think they need workers. 
I guess everyone needs workers. Yeah. That's something that we hear with mm -hmm. every company we talk to. So they're investing in their future workforce by trying to stem or mm -hmm. drum up interest in this technology from every age. So yeah. I've had a few a few companies. Playing a long game, GE. Yeah, <laughs> a real few, long game. I, I think they have the luxury <laughs> to do that. Um, I've had a few companies now this this year alone say to me, we're like older managers have come and said, we just got some new younger college age kids coming in. They're really excited about this. They want us to bring this in or mm -hmm. they use this in school or they use this somewhere else and they don't understand why we don't have it. It's, it's going to be part of a, how do you offer a competitive workforce or workplace mm -hmm. soon is being, hey, look, we, we are keeping up with this technology. We are invested in this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I've seen pretty regularly where if a company isn't using 3D printing at all and they're not paying attention to it, when they hire an intern or a co-op, those are the people who start pushing for it. Because mm -hmm. they've seen it. Pushing for change because they understand the technology much better than engineers who have been there for a long time and didn't kind of grow up with If you're 3D somebody printing. in your 60s, 3D printing is... Probably doesn't matter. A scary, <laughs> it could be a scary futuristic notion, you know, really. And I can see, yeah, you got to get some buy-in from the younger people. Yeah. Yeah, but I think uh, I think it's good naturally that you know bigger companies are willing to to invest in the future and give people opportunities. I wish I had three D printers when I was in school. Right. Um, I would have would have loved that, but <laughs> I can only imagine for the, somebody like the two of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it says no. They they have a neat quote in the article that says you know the sooner we can put additive or additive technology in the hands of the next generation of engineers and material scientists and chemists, the sooner we'll all realize its potential. So I think that that they'll they'll find that pays dividends you know down the road for sure. I would hope so. Um, now it's where I think I want to deviate a little bit, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about some of the the smaller companies in 3D printing. Um, there was a video that got pretty popular this past month about a croissant maker. Oh. Um, and the first couple times I saw it pop up like on my timeline, um, I didn't watch it. I was like, oh, a 3D printed croissant maker. Like that's just a, I'm never gonna need one of those. How many croissants I have croissants I made? croissants a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a French pastry chef, so. Yeah, why, why would I need to watch that? It wasn't that. I didn't, I didn't think it was anything special, right? Right. Um, but then I kept seeing it pop up more and more, and I actually watched it, and I absolutely loved it. Okay. So, so what did you love about it? What I loved about it was it showed 3D printing in a problem-solving process. Mm -hmm. And the guy kind of walked step-by-step step through, like, hey, this was the last uh, croissant dough rolling machine that I made, and it has this problem and this problem, and I don't like this, and it takes up too much space. And rattled all of these off and then you saw him go into CAD and draw something up and then print parts and then see how they fit and change things and iterate very quickly almost span of like maybe a 12 minute video to the point where at the end of it he had a really nicely functioning dough rolling machine but you know what I think is so interesting is at the end of the day he's a baker Right, he's selling no. croissants, right? Because that's not what the applicant, okay, because I didn't watch the whole video, so I wanted to make sure. Sure, sure. Okay, so um, he's not, like, making pastries with He's it. He's an engineer. Okay. And so he has created this entire cool YouTube channel around perfecting and, like, reducing the error in French cooking, because he's a French guy. Um, and so this is, like, what he's dedicating all of his time to. Love it. And so a lot of the off-the-shelf kitchen gadgets that he has and tries to use aren't good enough and they're not expensive. consistent enough and so he like tries to improve them and make new machines to improve what he's making See, but i and, and <laughs> I, I i agree with your sentiment because the thing that gets me the most excited is hearing these cool stories where it's not like you know this big lab incorporated 3d printing to right. save thousands of dollars a year it's like your average person who does something completely unrelated to 3D yes. printing or engineering <laughs> finds a really cool application to make their business really different and unique and stand apart because mm -hmm. they were able to you know, try something different and try 3D printing technology. I think that that's way more interesting than you know, XYZ Corporation you know, makes massive change, like eh, yeah. that kind of stuff gets buried. Too bad it's like, a real corporation. XYZ <laughs> Corporation? Oh yeah, it's a three D oh, printing yeah. company. <laughs> oh, <well. laughs> it's like X Y Z three D printing, yeah. such and whatever. Well, I meant it um, in the hyperbo <laughs> hyperbolic <laughs> reference yeah. of whoever it might be. Yeah, but um, 
I like it because it shows just like a great example of problem solving mm -hmm. um, and using 3D printing and it packs all of that um, into a very quick video. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I thought it was cool. But you, it I mean, got pretty popular. But online. it does the it does the same <laughs> thing. Three D printing does everywhere else, right? Takes right. an otherwise laborious, inconsistent process, mm -hmm. just finds a way to standardize it, streamline it, and make it consistently routine. Like it, it's doing the same thing it does yeah. in industry. It's just applied in the kitchen. Right, right. In a in more of a workshop setting. Yeah. I, uh, and I learned something about making croissants, which is always important. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess they're very finicky they're pastries. Very challenging. They're very I, difficult to make. I actually know quite a bit about this <laughs> because you? there's a local restaurant. Um, you know, this is, it's on YouTube, so I'm not okay. going to, you know, try to, there's a local restaurant here in, <laughs> in upstate New York that is uh, very, very well known for their, like, croissant sandwiches. Okay. I'll tell you about it later. The croissant witch? I think I've seen commercials. <laughs> no, no, you probably haven't seen commercials. It's not a croissant witch, no. Um, They're two for three dollars. But there right? was like a big story <laughs> that I saw on the local news. Like this woman, oh. she was a teenager, and she went to France and studied in France for like ten months to learn how to be a French pastry baker. And then the thing that she hung her hat on when she came back here and opened up this bakery with her mom was. Um, the croissants and the croissants are the most amazing thing because they're so hard to keep consistent and mm -hmm. be right and be the same formula every time and have it be all those individual layers over and over. It's a really painstaking process, yeah. but that's a way to make it repeatable and easy and controllable. Right. So. There's more to it than you think. There's yeah. a lot behind the croissant. It was like the the layers need to be even. Yeah. There's a special refrigerator. But dude, it has the right croissant. Rested. It's got to be. But there's an oven that's important. I don't know. You get the right um, croissant though. I love to peel apart croissants. Yeah. And eat them little pieces. I've had some very average croissants in my day. I've never probably had like a, a nice gourmet one. I like every one. croissant. Um, but <laughs> they're croissant. delicious nonetheless. Um, so yeah. Um, What's fine? Can we like apply this to ravioli too and like spaghetti? I'm, I'm sure we could eating, actually. Like, I because I yes, that's what I thought. I thought it looked like a pasta roller yeah, at first when, yeah. when I saw like the video. I saw. I feel like every podcast we end up on a food topic. At least one. <laughs> food is a great topic. Yeah. <laughs> In this case, we're not printing food, which makes me happy. We're say, printing yeah, the device yeah. to make we're the food, about which I'm, I'm okay with. Right. <laughs> uh, but if we're not talking about 3D printing food, we can talk about another buzzworthy, popular oh. uh, 3D printing anomaly, and that is that Lulzbot, a.k.a. Alef Objects, um, actually announced a partnership and a new product in a bioprinter. Right. And so this is a commercially available couple thousand dollar off the shelf bioprinter. And it's the first time that I've ever seen it be like an actual product by a recognized 3D printing brand. So I thought it was really interesting. So, all right. So when you're talking about a bioprinter, what is your end result. I mean, that, that's mm -hmm. the, the thing that holds the most curious for me. What am I feeding it? And what am I getting in return? Is it a glob of tissues? Is it an organ? Is it, you know what I mean? So what, it, what are you feeding it? Is it, is it <laughs> a material of stem cells? Or is it a slurry of it's human usually components? A, like a number of jelly type components mixed together. Yeah. But you like medical stuff. In my you head? Probably not, know not, more about this than I do. In, in my head, it's stuff. like the movie Face Off, and they just have a little laser run over and recreate his ear, like, oh. all at once. Like, that's what I'm picturing. That'd be so, sweet. Yeah. So it's, it's, <laughs> more, it's more like, if you look at a bioprinter, it's more like a, I don't know how to describe it, like a syringe. Yeah. It's more like a syringe on a, on a, a gantry. And like you said, it is more, okay. it's more of like a paste. They're taking cells of some kind, putting it in some kind of media to help it flow and building a three-dimensional object. Now those cells can, depending on what it is, can grow together and kind of become a, a single object. But where I see this machine more of is, these machines are usually, what I've seen at schools, are like converted at-home 3D printers where they stuck the, th the syringe on mm -hmm. and they're, they're, they're doing testing on the materials, but they've basically makeshifted a, a bioprinter because a, a certified bioprinter is very, very expensive. So if this, assumably, if it's Lulzbot, it's probably going to be in the five thousand dollar range or say, somewhere so in that range. Is is the eye-catching headline more so that Lulzbot is 
the one who's bringing a product like this to market? I well, think so. I it's, mean, a, the it's a product. In my opinion. Okay. It's a product that's probably much cheaper than what's available, mm -hmm. as opposed to having to like make it yourself. And I think what this will give is the, so like, people are doing like DIY print an organ. Mostly schools, not print yeah. an organ, but if you're a university, to do research. Yeah. Wow. But you need you need the proper equipment to do the research on the materials. Where that's like when I was at school, they were doing material research, but they had to basically make their own printer. See, that's so interesting, too, because there's some parts of this industry that are so mature. Like, mm -hmm. we look at the manufacturing yeah. side yeah, of it all absolutely. the time. That is a very mature product. Like, look in here. These are really <laughs> well-researched and industrialized and, like, perfected machines that have taken years of hours of testing and whatever, versus DIY, I cobbled together this printer to make organs. <laughs> like, yeah. When you think or, about the scale of that, it looks like cartilage tips. or, or yeah. blood vessels. But I'm working with something that's a lot, lot more challenging than a hard thermoplastic that yes. industry's yes. been using for years. I'm using a, a living piece of material that right, has right. different uh, components and material. It's just yeah, I think the world. I think the big deal here is this is a recognized brand that's been around for years. Mm -hmm. They made something much different than they're usually making because now for, for a those market who that they're not really in and so for those who don't know lulzba is typically where do they fall in the spectrum of product offerings yeah they're typically what we call a, a prosumer 3d printer sure so they fall between like 2500 and six grand i think yeah somewhere in that range um, i thought it was like five yeah so they uh but it's an open source printer right yeah yes. they're they're like if not the most open source company. Open, yeah, they're known for open source, right? You can go yeah. see their R&D online right, right. now. <laughs> yeah, they, they love open source a, a whole heck of a lot. Um, so do you think that maybe... <laughs> they're very proud of it. So if people are DIY all of these other projects in university settings, and Lulzbot prides himself on being open source, do you think that that's kind of like a natural, like, hey, let us give you some other components to help you what you're, with what you're doing anyways? What do you think? Yes, um, the way I've always kind of viewed open source is, yes, they're publishing all the information. So in theory, you could make one yourself. But uh, usually what the manufacturer is doing is we're sourcing the materials for cheaper than you can get them, and we can build it better than you can build it. Right. So they people might take, like, bits and pieces of it. So, like, I know, like, with the Marlin open source code, mm -hmm. that thing's been shredded and turned into all new yes. applications, <laughs> and it appears in all sorts of different printers where... You could see some of the stuff Lulzbot doing maybe show up in other printers, but likely you'll probably just see their products sold more. Sure. What are we forecasting will be something that is novelty printed, or we will think of it as, oh yeah, well of course that's printed now, in five or 10 years versus today. My prediction is a little more dire. <laughs> oh, I <great>. think <laughs> so many things are gonna be printed. I think that, um, the age of mass customization is upon us and mm. personalization and that inures itself to 3d printing so well because you can just do one-offs um, we don't currently live in a world where it's feasible or affordable to just one-off make something for you on right. request I, I need a minimum order or something like that i think that that's probably the most fundamental changes i'll be able to personalize and create a lot more things that I can today, not necessarily new products or new things that are just not available, but current things that I buy from current vendors. I'll be able to buy for myself, be personalized, be specific and customized. Would you be sourcing those ease. locally? Is that the, what you're imagining? Potentially, or I'm, okay. I'm envisioning like shoes. I'm, yeah. buying, I'm buying shoes, right? So I want to make yeah. a pair of shoes personalized for me. I want to uh, I want to get like a rack for my garage. Okay. Um, I want to, you know, hang, I want three shelves over here and mm -hmm. I want four hooks over there and uh, stuff, cubby holes going like this. I want to, I'll be able to go on Wayfair, plug that in, Wayfair will print it out and ship it to me. Gotcha. Like that kind of thing will happen in okay. the future. I think it'll be a little bit more commonplace. Yeah. I'm with you. So it's not necessarily one specific thing, but I think it'll just, it will change fundamentally how we'll be able to continue to buy it because personalization is where everything seems to be kind of going. Right. And that's a really big, well, big way that 3D printing can help. Well, customization allows people to have a better product. Yeah. And as long as you have the technology to be able to make better products catered to each individual. And, and cost effective. And it's cost effective, you it's know. Not, it's not cost effective now for me. Yeah. Needing me to make a mold and yeah. shoot a mold and, and make this product for ten people or ten times. Right. To do it a thousand times is barely cost effective. So, mm -hmm. yeah, to be able to just one off and all right, it'll be down for three hours and I'll make this and I'll only make four bucks on it, but I'll make a hundred dollars on the next one. Right. You'll have right. that economy of scale eventually, and yeah.
Yeah, I, uh, I'm with you. I think um, more conceptually, I think manufacturing uh, or just the making of things will start to be more distributed. And so having a, a, a quote-unquote manufacturing center like uh, a kiosk or a vending machine in the grocery store yeah. that 3D prints out things could be very feasible. Yeah. Um, and then a, a more boring direct answer is circuit boards. Um, I think uh, I think circuit boards uh, could and will be three D. You know these things that you never see. Yeah, the, the things that are in <laughs> everything. Yeah. The things those. you never see, Don't do anything about but them. are everywhere. Um, I think it should be very possible, especially with uh, the advances in materials we've seen yeah. so far, uh, to print a circuit board, have a pick and place, automate, have an automated system that uses a pick and place to drop all the components, and then automatically puts that into a reflow oven and solders everything, um, and that would just kick. What about, like, semiconductors? Um, what about them? Can you do that with, with 3D printers <laughs> today? Um, I think some people have done it in a lab setting. Yeah. Um, but... We actually talked about that, I believe, in episode two or three. Wow. I don't think I was in that one because that was... We that talked was about batteries, else. yeah, with, yeah. like, watches, where the watch company wants to make the wristband the battery. Yeah, oh, so we did super, talk about that. Super customized that okay. batteries for smaller and yeah. customized electronics. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to go back and watch there our, our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. I don't myself. Educate yourself with yeah. our podcast. My bad, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, nah, nah, you're good. Um, I think semiconductors and transistors are so cheap these days, right. we would never have to 3D right. print them. You'd have to need one really funky Special transistor stuff, right? or semiconductor for it to ever make sense. Like These things are pennies. So what about what about like a um, a chip processor? Um, again, you're dealing with thing. just a little cluster of transistors. But um. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of like you know they're they're talking about like these tiny microchips that are the yeah. width of human hairs. Right, like right. you can't print that small. That's not what I'm imagining. I'm okay. imagining the the board that all those things go on. To. Right, right, right. Okay, okay. Fair. Makes more sense that way. Yeah, that's that's my thought. Your practical application. You know. Right. right. <laughs> Let's bring us. I'm gonna bring everyone back down a little bit closer to reality <laughs> from you know all the the grand visions we had here. Um, we have one more story, as far as I know. Um, and this was a story that you told me about. I actually didn't see it. So do you want to talk about Ultimaker and what they're doing? Sure. So they uh, they just picked up their German headquarters and moved it to the Netherlands. I saw that. U- Utrecht. How do you pronounce yeah, that? Yeah, U- Ultrecht or something. U- like U- that? I don't know. Not a clue. Yeah. <laughs> Starts with a U. I'm just going to go with I the Netherlands. I was just in the Netherlands yeah. like last month. You were. I, you know, I was in Amsterdam for yeah. a few days. Yeah. So don't know why they did that particularly, but they have just completely rebranded. So they okay. came out with new logos, and you can definitely get the strong sense they're pulling away from their educational kind of theming. And they want to keep capitalizing on the success they've been having in industrial theming. So you've seen them push their case studies with, what, Volkswagen? Yeah, um, a lot of automotive companies, yeah. aerospace companies. Maybe not aerospace. For, for but it's a German s- company that's now a Dutch company. Dutch, yeah. They've but always they've always been in the Netherlands, but they've officially moved the headquarters there. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, I think there's a couple interesting points here. One, um, the Netherlands, for whatever reason, has... Uh, a wealth of 3D printing and 3D scanning companies. It's a very technologically advanced civilization. Is it? Yeah. Okay, I wouldn't <laughs> know. Um, and uh, uh, they're moving their headquarters. I know Lulzbot recently opened up a European headquarters, and, and so they had, they had it in the Netherlands. I don't know if it's in the Netherlands or not. Oh, it's in God. it's in Europe somewhere. Um, Most European <laughs> headquarters are. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah I would yeah. <laughs> imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's so interesting that Ultimaker uh, started on Kickstarter, if I remember correctly. Oh, really? Um, okay. It's a hell of a they, success story for Kickstarter. They weren't, they weren't on Kickstarter. I'm wrong. But they were started in a makerspace yeah. mm-hmm. in Europe. Their first kits that they shipped out were made of laser-cut plywood, and people screwed and zip-tied them together. And they were very... DIY oriented and hobbyist oriented and maybe they were for schools and it's a completely different company no, today. No, it's a big boy actual. Yeah. So yeah, it went large from like it's in the Netherlands. Right. Built it build it yourself to like the the first ultimakers which were pretty good. They were good machines and then they came out with the 
the twos and the threes. I yeah. think the two is when it really exploded with the education market. Mm. Yeah. And then the three wasn't quite at the three. They were starting to get industrial. Then with the five, they've been pushing it more, more towards the industrial market. Right. More and more towards engineers, businesses, returns See, on investments in case studies. You and all literally of those watched things. that brand grow. From, yeah. yeah. From yeah, from conception into now interesting transformation to kind of see take place yeah and mm -hmm. similar companies haven't made it yeah um i think ultimaker and lulzbot are kind of like uh you know one in a hundred one mm -hmm. in a thousand mm -hmm. of small 3d printing companies that started marketing started their whole business on makers and education and have successfully made the jump to a more stable market now no one wants to be in education Right. is is our not to speak for everyone here but that's a perception <laughs> i think <laughs> i think is is our read on how these companies are operating is no one wants to be an educator just not a, ge well just about well uh, but ge is doing philanthropy they're not true. they're not trying they're to not sell they're not selling their it. printers i don't agree with you it's not philanthropy it's like what apple does it's what solidworks does adobe yeah you are familiarizing okay. the next generation with your product, so I you guess, prefer it later on. And so I personally prefer Macs because I started in third grade with them okay. all the way through college. I okay. think I think what, what Adam's trying to get at is I think companies are finding it much more difficult to be profitable in the education space than in the in mm. the manufacturing space. More opportunities in the manufacturing, manufacturing yeah. space, yeah. What, an, an educational printer can get used by 100 students, though, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and... and Really, if you think about it from the other, other perspective, one printer in the right school can impact the lives of thousands of engineers. Yeah. So future does it, does it future it? <laughs> so does it really not? Should they really not be focusing there? Because that's the future. Maybe that's what GE say. Maybe they're saying let's fill a void. I think. <sighs> you can't have one without the other, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so why not? I think why not do both? There is a workforce issue in engineers coming out of college not understanding 3d printing mm -hmm. um in in a lot of situations um i think it depends on your product i think it's purely a business move whereas ge you know they mostly make their own printers and sell their printers to other companies we're talking multi-million dollar solutions ultimaker lulzbot they're selling printers for a few thousand dollars right. They can't make any money. A little different transaction. Right, right. And so GE is able to, you know, sell multi-million dollar solutions and then donate <laughs> donate yeah. Ultimakers they, and Lulzbots. <laughs> yeah, they can basically <laughs> donate the size of that company to universities on a scale like that, and it's not going to hurt their bottom line because you just bought a new washing machine or right. whatever else that GE also owns. Yeah, so Jet it's, uh, it's interesting. But Very cool. Yep. Yeah. Is there anything else that you guys wanted to touch on that maybe you saw out in the I internet? Tried, I tried desperately <laughs> for like the past three hours to try to find like an off the beaten path, like yeah. weird story about a 3D printer, but I was unsuccessful. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so I guess the croissant maker is the only the fun croissant, story. Yeah, that was we the highlight. To talk about today. <laughs> yeah. If you haven't watched the whole That'll video the yet, you should watch the whole video. It's very well made. Okay. It's funny in my opinion. And if you like watching people make things on YouTube, like everyone does, I assume that's normal, um, then it'll be it'll be a good time. Uh, anyway, um, my name is Adam Fosnot. I realize we didn't do introductions. This is Kevin, this is Ken, and then we have Ben. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to watch this podcast. If you enjoyed it, uh, maybe you want to hit the thumbs up button uh, down there somewhere uh, so that we can stay motivated to keep making these for you and subscribe to our channel uh, so that you don't miss when we publish any more awesome videos. Check out our uh, unboxing videos. Oh, hold on, let me pan out. Yeah. Say it again. Check out um, some of our other videos. We've got a lot of videos where we're unboxing, uh, like our new Stratasys F120. Um, we have another cool unboxing video of our desktop metal studio series. Um, a lot of really cool stuff. Those are really neat videos. I encourage you guys to check those out too. Yep. Thanks for watching. Bye.